We're very grateful that you chose to join us tonight. We're also streaming live, so we know people are, lo are logging in from far away, and we're welcoming all of them as well. And we'll be recording this program and making it available for others. Uh, on behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to thank you for being here. This program is called Data-Driven Decisions in Crohn's Disease, Positioning Patients for Success. And it's supported by an educational grant from Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC. So thanks to Janssen. Today's activity is also brought to you by CME Outfitters, which is a jointly accredited provider for education for clinicians across the globe. Today's CME and CE activity is also eligible for ABIM mock points, so make sure you engage in today's event, answer our polling questions, submit questions, and provide your feedback. We definitely want your feedback. Once you complete today's program, be sure to provide your ABIM ID and birth date in the evaluation. CME Outfitters will submit your mock points for you. You can also claim this activity as CME for MIPS improvement activities. I'd also like to welcome all of our colleagues joining us remotely. We're happy that you're here on the web platform and on social media streams, which CME Outfitters is particularly good at. You can follow along by using the CME Outfitters Twitter handle that you see there. And you can also learn about new opportunities for CME and CE activities from CME Outfitters by following them. Our goal is to make this as interactive as possible. We know we have a smaller in-person group, but we want you to use the iPads, and certainly you can raise your hands, and we'll be happy to do that as well. In addition, the folks from CME Outfitters monitor the Twitter feed, and they'll be letting us know about any questions that come up there. So my name is David Rubin. I'm from the University of Chicago, and I'm joined by three outstanding faculty for tonight's program. First, we have uh, Oriana Damas. Dr. Damas is an assistant professor of medicine Director of Translational Studies for the Crohn's and Colitis Center at the Division of Gastroenterology in the Department of Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Welcome, Oriana. Thank you, happy to be here. This is Oriana's first symposium. We're very, very excited to have her with us. And then a couple of unknowns. Um, Dr. Millie Long is with us tonight. <laughs> Dr. Long, as you may know, co-directed the fabulously successful postgraduate course at this meeting. Congratulations again on that. Uh, Dr. Long is a professor of medicine, director of the Gastroenterology and Hepatology Fellowship Program and vice chief for education in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatologists, uh, Hepatology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Millie was also recently promoted to full professor. Congratulations on that too. Thank you. So welcome, Millie. We're happy to have you. And finally, uh, I'd like to introduce Miguel Riguero, my good friend. Uh, Dr. Riguero is now chair of the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute and chair of the Department of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. Are you still holding that role? For now. For now. <laughs> Anybody uh, interested? <laughs> his titles keep growing. The Pierre C. and Rene A. Bora Family Endowed Chair in Gastroenterology and Hepatology and professor in the Department of Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. So we have a great group. We have a wonderful case. We're gonna learn a little bit about Crohn's disease. So let's review our learning objectives, which are listed here. First, to incorporate individual disease characteristics into treatment decisions in Crohn's disease based on evidence-based recommendations. Second, to differentiate biologic therapies in Crohn's disease based on efficacy and long-term safety to achieve a rapid and durable treatment response. Durable is key. And Third, to develop a data-driven treatment algorithm for Crohn's to position treatment choices based on available data for efficacy, safety, and individual patient characteristics. So we'll be building on presentations around the journey of a single patient, and our patient is named L. And like many of our patients, you're gonna see the, the journey that L goes through in the different phases of her disease and her life. Our presentation is really designed to address the challenges that our patients face, and we hope that as clinicians, you'll be thinking about your own patients and learning as we go. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Long, who's gonna kick it off. Go ahead, Millie. Great, well, I'm so thrilled to be here, and I think that as what all of us do is we really center all of our research and uh, you know, so much of our ongoing efforts around individual uh, patients, and so I think it's important to center this around the story of L. So Elle is a 26-year-old teacher, and she presents with 
Intermittent, actually pretty severe, right-sided abdominal pain. She also feels that she has some abdominal distension during these times of pain. They can result in vomiting. And these episodes have been going on for about four months. She's also noted some increased bowel movement frequency. There's no blood, but she can go as frequently as seven times in a day. Due to these symptoms, she has noted a poor appetite, um, and she's all had some increased fatigue, and she's found it quite difficult to be productive at work. Importantly, she is a non-smoker, and when we examine her, um, you know, from a laboratory perspective, there's no evidence of infection. She does have a mildly elevated uh, C-reactive protein. Her hemoglobin, mild anemia with a hemoglobin of 10, and we do see an albumin that is um, somewhat uh, depressed at 3.1. And on abdominal exam, she does have an abdominal fullness, um, particularly in the right lower quadrant. We don't see any evidence of other extraintestinal manifestations or other findings. And so obviously with this young woman, one of the things we're going to pursue um, in a timely fashion is endoscopic evaluation. So I wanted to show you what her colonoscopy showed, um, which demonstrated really scattered, quite deep ulcers um, throughout the colon, um, somewhat more in the right colon. And then in her ileum, she had these longitudinal, quite serpiginous ulcerations uh, with associated edema. So importantly, we didn't see a, a fibrotic stricture, but there was significant edema there. And when you see these really curvilinear ulcerations like this, that is really pathognomonic for Crohn's disease. You know, we see sometimes individuals on NSAIDs and, you know, other aspects where you can see aphthous ulcerations and changes in the ileum, but these serpiginous ulcerations are really quite um, pathognomonic. And on pathology, uh, she has severe chronic active ileitis and colitis. And so, Knowing that, uh, we described some of her symptoms, her laboratory uh, evaluation, as well as her endoscopy. I'd love to hear from you all um, how you would characterize her disease severity. Would you call her mild to moderate, moderate, moderate to severe, or severe, or uh, I'm not sure. So please do on your iPad key in um, what your thought process is for her disease severity. Okay, so it looks like the majority of participants put her as moderate to severe, although we did have a, a sprinkling of moderate and severe, as well as I'm not sure. No one really thought she was mild to moderate, and I, I completely agree um, with this assessment. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about why. Um, and one of the things that we did ask in this question was really in regards to her disease severity, which is one thing I really want you to start thinking in. In other words, not necessarily activity, which is in regards to her symptoms, as they are when we see her, but severity, taking into account other factors that influence her disease course. So one of the things that's very important in Crohn's disease is that disease uh, progresses in the majority of patients. It's really only a small percentage, about 20%, that will have an indolent course, meaning they'll have mild inflammatory changes that don't progress to any structural damage. What that means is that up to 80% of patients with Crohn's will require hospitalization, and many will actually require surgery. But importantly, this has changed somewhat over the last few decades in that the 10-year risk of surgery is actually um, kind of declining uh, to some extent, perhaps decreasing in the biologic era from a, from a number of around 50% to now potentially more like 30%. And if you look at the graph on the right, um, the black line in the top is all surgeries. And you can see it is coming down somewhat. But when you actually break it out into elective versus non-elective surgeries, what you're seeing is that elective surgeries have been going up over the last uh, few decades and non-elective surgeries have been going down. And I think this is really important because what it means is we're seeing less uh, emergent resections and that we as inflammatory bowel disease providers really can use surgery as a tool in an elective format to help to um, induce a surgical remission in appropriate patients. And so I think these data are reassuring, um, but we can obviously do better. And so when we think about disease severity, one of the factors that we want to include is actually the assessment of disease risk. The patient in front of us you know, uh, what is their risk for being one of those progressive patients as compared to one of those patients, the minority, who, who stay inflammatory, who really don't develop complications? 
And so I'd like to focus on the right-hand side of this um, figure, which demonstrates those characteristics associated with a moderate or high risk of having disease complications. So uh, individuals who are a young age at diagnosis, extensive anatomic involvement, and really by that, uh, what I mean is uh, having upper tract disease. If an individual has evidence of upper tract Crohn's disease, kind of above the ligament of trites, that by definition is an incredibly aggressive phenotype. And those are patients who I, I really am treating um, uh, kind of uh, with a, a biologic, preferably actually an anti-TNF with an immunomodulator really from the start. Perianal disease, um, very difficult um, process that really it has a, is a marker for a very complicated disease course. And certainly having severe rectal disease as well. When we think about patients like our patient L, who actually had those deeper ulcers, that is a, a poor prognostic sign that they will go on to pr uh, progressive disease. Individuals, of course, who've already had a prior surgical resection or stricturing or penetrating behavior. And actually, smoking is a big risk factor in Crohn's disease, um, particularly in patients. You know, Once you've had a surgery, you can have in markedly increased risk of further recurrence and need for further operation with smoking. You know, I like to tell my patients that there's no medication I could give them that would be as good as stopping smoking. Um, stopping smoking uh, dramatically reduces um, someone's risk of complications and improves um, their inflammation. So those are the risk factors. And, and, and so we need to use those risk factors to help us to understand who should receive early intensive therapy. So again, those factors such as ileal disease, upper tract involvement, or, or potentially if someone has extraintestinal manifestations, things like pyoderma gangrenosum, um, extensive um, uh, joint involvement, uh, particularly if it's axial involvement, those are individuals that you really would want to use more intensive therapy earlier. And again, those younger age, perianal disease, which has a really disabling disease course, uh, a smoker, someone with endoscopic severity, and actually there are a few other possible components. There may be genetic or serologic markers that are associated with complicated behavior as well. And so when we take that into consideration, we can actually think about um, where our patient set, stands with in regards to those risk factors. One other aspect I'd like to really emphasize is that endoscopic severity is, is really so important. Um, and this is something that I would encourage in your practice to really try to use a standardized approach. And I do this in my practice. This is a, an example of the short endoscopic score for Crohn's disease, so that you can actually apply a, a number um, to the degree of inflammation you see in a very standardized process, um, where you're looking at size of ulcers, the ulcerated surface, the affected surface, and the presence of narrowing in each segment. And the scoring in the bottom right here helps you to understand um, different categories and severity of inflammation by summing up these numbers. But why I think this is important is that you know, when you look endoscopically and you just describe inflammation in the terminal ileum, you could really be seeing what's on the left, which is horrible, deep ulcerations, um, really as far as you can see in the ileum. Or you might see just aptha, as you can see on the right. But something like this SESCD really helps you to numerically differentiate those and really use a yardstick for assessing response to therapy. And so let me circle back to L. So when we think about these factors that L has, she certainly has ileal disease lo location. She has a younger age. She doesn't actually have a stricture yet, but she has so much edema, you heard the clinical symptoms that she's having, that she's having obstructive type symptoms. So this is an individual who really would meet these criteria for early intensive therapy to prevent downstream complications. And so, you know, I find that it useful when I'm having some of these conversations with my patients to have some tools that I can discuss with them why, uh, in, in this fact, in this situation, we want to be more aggressive. So this is something, I'm not sure if you've um, used this in your practice yet, but it's a tool called the CD path that Corey Siegel was instrumental uh, in developing. And if you see over on the left, various input variables that are some of those same factors that we just discussed that are risk factors for complicated disease, such as disease location or perianal involvement. It also includes um, blood test markers, some of the serologic markers and even genetic markers. When that information is pooled for your individual patient, what this provides is their risk over time of having a complication from their Crohn's disease. So for example, in these graphs, a low risk, a medium risk, and a high risk patient. 
And what you can do is use this in your practice. Again, this is uh, available um, at this point, and, and you could actually use this in a discussion with your patients to help to explain why they might be, need more early intensive therapy if they have a high risk of disability related to their uh, underlying Crohn's disease. And what we want to do is act in a window of opportunity. So our young patient, L has quite severe inflammation, not yet strictured, but will be there very soon. We want to reverse that inflammation now so that we can prevent those downstream complications. And what we think, we don't know, is that by an earlier opportunity with, of intervention within this window, we may be able to change the natural course of Crohn's disease. And that's what we're trying to do. But we also have to address with the individual patient what their treatment goals are. You know, and a lot of this really depends on at what point uh, you meet the patient in their journey uh, with disease. If you meet them early, you may very well be able to um, describe a goal of complete mucosal healing, um, complete symptomatic um, remission. But in many instances, you might be meeting a patient later where they may already have a fibrostenotic complication. And so symptomatic remission may not be uh, achievable in late stage disease. Have conversations about what those goals may be. Um, diagnosed late in the course, they may have already experienced a complication, and therefore, obviously, we want to get them earlier, but if not, have realistic expectations and biological as well as symptom-based goals of how we can achieve the remission they need. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Dr. Rubin. Great. Millie, that's a great way to start. I'm actually going to ask you a question before sure. we move along. Um, I wanted you to comment on your interpretation of the labs that this patient had. Mm -hmm. So L had anemia with a hemoglobin of right. 10 grams and an albumin of 3.1. So just in terms of thinking through that, what are your thoughts about why she has those two abnormalities and how that might be addressed or worked up further as part of this evaluation? Absolutely, so those are poor prognostic indicators. So she's already anemic, um, she's already hypoalbuminemic. And the anemia is likely, it's probably somewhat multifactorial, but she had pretty deep ulcerations. So she's likely losing blood in her stool. Mm -hmm. uh, she's probably iron deficient related to absorption. It also tells me that this didn't happen immediately. This has been happening for a while and she's developed this anemia over time. She's been symptomatic for four months, but this is probably gonna going on longer. And that albumin is worrisome for me um, because you know she's talked about having a reduced appetite, she's not taking in as much, but she's also clearly not absorbing well. And so she could be losing, um, having something of a protein losing enteropathy as well. But that really impacts our medication choice because particularly if we're thinking about using a biologic, she may actually lose that drug in the stool. So to be very thoughtful about the dosing, um, as well as whether or not we use a concomitant immunomodulator to help to maximize that drug level. So all of those factors really also play into my choice of therapy. Right, and that's a great way to connect everything. Um, my additional comment and just a pearl for the audience is that when people are iron deficient um, and they're inflamed, uh, we've learned that that actually affects the ability to absorb oral iron. So even inflammation downstream will affect iron absorption upstream. So that's often why we need to consider IV iron while we're trying to get the disease under control if we're going to address that, if that's part of the problem. Completely agree about the albumin. Uh, patients are often not eating because they learn consciously or subconsciously. It makes their symptoms worse. So that's going to be a great lead into the presentation by Dr. Damas in a minute about diet. So now we're going to talk a bit more about treatment of her Crohn's disease. And we're going to think about what do you do for this patient? And among the many options we have, how do you know which drug to use? And what are the available uh, guidelines and evidence to help us choose a therapy that's going to be the right one for her? So let's go back to another poll question. I'm going to ask the audience, what would be your treatment recommendation for L? So your first option is infliximab with or without an immunomodulator then adalimumab with or without an immunomodulator, ustekinumab, our anti-IL-1223, uh, vitalizumab, an anti-integrin, no therapy at this time, a Mediterranean diet, surgery, or I'm not sure. That's a lot of options. That's a lot of options. <laughs> what do you guys want to do? All right, so it looks like the majority chose the first option, infliximab with or without an immunomodulator, and we'll talk a little bit about that. 
have a couple folks who wanted adalimumab, used to kinemab, uh, and one person who thought maybe the diet might be uh, helpful, as well as a few who still want to learn more today and learn about all this. So no problems, this is why you're here. And in fact, when you talk about choosing therapies for patients with Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis for that matter, there are a number of different variables that come into play. You might start all the way on the right and say, well, what's the payer gonna let us use, which is always an overarching problem. But let's start on the left here. And first we have to think about the therapy uh, in terms of its available evidence for efficacy, whether the patient actually has the disease and the severity of illness that the drug has been studied and is available to treat, how well and how fast does it work, does it have a durable response, meaning does it last? You know, you want therapies that are going to continue to work after you start using them. One of the biggest challenges we face when we talk to patients about starting therapy is the concern we have that even if it works, it may not last. And we know this is a big challenge in IBD. Then you have to think a little bit about pharmacokinetics and whether there may be a role for therapeutic drug monitoring. Uh, Millie just mentioned to you that that low albumin might give you a clue that we may have some challenges of exposure if we use a protein-based therapy like a monoclonal antibody, and whether we should use combo or monotherapy. You may have your own thoughts about that. Uh, and then what drugs will we use in order if one doesn't work? And then, of course, safety concerns, uh, immediate safety related to infections. Patients have lots of concerns about cancer, but thankfully that often is not something that is very significant at all with our current therapies. Um, and then there are also safety concerns. Remember that if the drug doesn't work or if we don't use a therapy that's effective, uh, the disease is gonna progress. And that's actually part of the safety picture as well. And then of course we have our individual patient. How sick are they? What are their other characteristics that might help us choose therapy? And we even have the option of asking people, do you want something that's an infusion or an injection, more convenience? And I often say that when we talk about convenience in managing a disease, you know we've made some progress because it used to be that we'd use whatever would work and whatever it took to try and get these patients feeling better. And then of course all the other disease characteristics that Millie has so beautifully summarized. So with that, we're actually gonna start with a presentation and discussion about the role of diet for Crohn's disease. And I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Damas to teach us and I'm sure you're gonna find this to be very educational. Go ahead, Ariana. Yeah, so historically, the story of diet and IBD wasn't really something that was researched. But over time, we have learned that diet is really playing an intricate role in the development of IBD. And I'll show you a few slides later on that show that. But also that it's a really important part in the treatment paradigm of IBD and within that of Crohn's disease. So we know what causes IBD in the first place. What does, where does Crohn's develop? We know it has to be in a genetically susceptible host but what we know about genetics is that actually it only explains about 20% of the heritability. So there has to be more. And in that, there's environmental exposure. So we think about a genetically susceptible host and then someone that perhaps is eating a bad diet. We know the effects that diet can play on the microbiome through various studies that have demonstrated this. And so can a bad diet result in dysbiosis that ultimately, right, in that perfect storm, offset an ongoing immune response that doesn't shut down in the colon or in the small bowel. And so I'll go through a few slides kind of highlighting that. And these three nine studies that were presented at DDW in the, in the past one that, just, that was just in 2021, nicely show that in fact a very processed diet is associated with an increased risk of developing inflammatory bowel disease. We see three cohorts that were presented. One was done out of 21 countries where they asked about diet intake. Another one was done here in the United States where they looked at data from the nurse's health study. And in another study, which was a smaller study, as a case control. But what they all have in common is that they found that a processed, an ultra-processed food led to an increased risk of developing Crohn's disease. So what does processed and ultra-processed really mean? So processed foods is really food that, is, that you can identify, let's say like canned green beans that have some sort of additive. Whereas ultra processed food really involves food that is really in, unrecognizable from the farm. So ice cream, chocolates, and, and that sort of thing that you can find in fast foods. 
So again, we see that theme happen in these epidemiologic studies that are linking really a bad diet, a fast food diet, and ultra-processed foods in the development of Crohn's disease. So what happens once disease sets in? We know that malnutrition can occur. Why? Because patients tend to um, ignore things that are take, not taken foods that will give them more symptoms. And so what we see in this nice study that was just presented in DDW, they looked at a cohort of about 130 patients and they found a prevalence of malnutrition of about 36%. So think about this when you're taking care of your patients. And by the way, patients don't have to be overweight to be malnourished. And so what they also found was a high prevalence of micronutrients. And this is why it's so important that when you're doing your routine checks or your IBD labs, you also incorporate micronutrients into your lab uh, surveillance. And this includes ferritin, vitamin D, vitamin B12, which we know can also cause fatigue, which is very common in our patients. But what was cool about this study is that they also looked at which risk tool or malnutrition risk tool had the greatest sensitivity and specificity for predicting malnutrition over time. And by the way, we know that malnutrition is also associated with increased risk of hospitalizations and surgeries over time. So it's really important to identify malnutrition as we take care of our patients. But basically what they found is that the MERT score, which is in the, the third row on the right side of the table, was a very good predictor of malnutrition. And so there's three, uh, score, three factors that are associated within the MERT score. And that tends to be a BMI, it tends, it's also weight loss within three months, and it's also CRP. So as we think about malnutrition and we think about diet and the treatment paradigm, we also have to think about things beyond improving nutrition, beyond improving and alleviating symptoms, which are so important to our patients as well. But we also have to think about how can we start to look at diet as a treatment strategy to reduce inflammation. And this is what we'll go over in the next few slides. Some of the diet studies that have come out they start to look at diet as treatment for Crohn's disease, whether that be as sole therapy or as adjunctive therapy. We know that exclusive enteronutrition has been studied and has demonstrated mucosal healing in the pediatric literature. But we're all adults, and in the adult world, exclusive enteronutrition is really hard to get your patients to follow. It can also be a little bit expensive and hard to cover. So in taking advantage of intro nutrition, this Crohn's disease exclusion diet was developed where partial nutrition is really taking place in this diet with gradual reintroduction of more foods and gradual reduction of intro nutrition. And what's neat about this uh, type, this diet in particular, is that there's two randomized control trials that have been done already with demonstrated efficacy. And so what you can see in this figure is that, and this one happened to be in, in the pediatrics uh, patients, but what you can see is that the clinical remission was achieved in these patients, highlighted in darker blue, and also biochemical remission with sustained remission over a period of 12 weeks. What's interesting here, and this is why I chose this figure, is that when compared to exclusive enteronutrition, which we think of historically as very effective in achieving mucosal healing in patients with mild to moderate Crohn's disease, when you compare this diet to exclusive enteronutrition, we actually see higher efficacy rates for this diet. And the reason the researchers think is because of compliance. So it's really hard to have nutrition from exclusive enteronutrition or from, from cans all the time. And so we have to think about how can we create diets that maybe they incorporate a little bit of enteronutrition, but slowly we phase that out. And this study nicely highlights that. And more recently, just an echo, we were able to see that the Crohn's disease exclusion diet also held in adult patients with mild to moderate Crohn's disease. So I'm in the diet world. This is what I do as a, as a researcher. And I found this incredibly exciting because this is an opportunity for our patients to think about diet and for, re and for clinicians to think about diet as a treatment strategy, as particularly in those with mild to moderate Crohn's disease. In this figure, you can see that remission was achieved in the patients that were on this diet, and it was pretty good. It was week six, week 12, week 24. About half of patients, 52% of patients in week 24 had sustained remission.
And at week 24, they also checked endoscopically, and about a third of the patients had achieved remission or endoscopic healing with this diet therapy alone. And we'll see more of these studies come out, but this study is certainly promising. And just like in the drug world, we have head-to-head -head studies on different, drug stu on different drugs, we're starting to see the same thing surface in the diet world. So two very popular diets are the Mediterranean diet and the specific carbohydrate diet. I'm sure your patients have asked you about the efficacy of this diet in, in Crohn's disease. The specific carbohydrate diet tends to be very restrictive. Um, it tends to exclude grains in particular, which many patients can tolerate, and it excludes dairy and all sorts of sweeteners. The Mediterranean diet just asks to avoid red and processed meat and also some sweets. And I shall say that a lot of the diets for Crohn's disease, what the element that they truly have in common is the avoidance of all sorts of processing, processed foods or ultra processed foods. And I really think that there is truth to that, not just from the epidemiologic data that I presented to you earlier, but from some nature study that looked at emulsifiers and how it can really lead to inflammation. And there's been more studies on that subsequently. But back to this slide. So what we looked at here, what the researchers looked at here was a comparison of this Mediterranean diet versus a specific carbohydrate diet. And what they looked at, what they found in the end, and they compared the efficacy or achievement of clinical remission by week six and by week 12 on either of these diets. And they found that patients, a good chunk of patients, were able to achieve clinical remission, about 40% on each side, on each arm. And what was interesting um, and good for our patients is that they found that either of the arm was good and no, no arm was better than the other one. And so we can start to tell our patients that they could follow either a specific carbohydrate diet or they can follow a Mediterranean diet and that both will help them with achieving symptomatic remission. Now, secondary outcomes the study looked at were fecal calprotectin and CRP. So basically what they found, and, and I shall say that the study was not powered to detect biochemical improvement. And so what they found is that CRP, there was some response, although not too significant. Um, and in fecal calprotectin, they didn't find a response. But again, I told you it's because it was also underpowered. And actually the patients, this was in patients with mild to moderate Crohn's disease. And the patients that started off with an abnormal fecal calprotectin to begin with were very few, about 13 in the Mediterranean and 23 in the specific carbohydrate diet. So what we can tell our patients from this study is that perhaps both diets are equivalent in achieving clinical remission, but we'll need more studies about later on to determine whether biochemical remission is achieved in one versus the other. And so I told you a little bit earlier about how common it is for patients to avoid certain types of foods. And really this study nicely highlighted that. It showed that, as you can see here, this was a survey that was administered in about 1,000 patients or so through the IBD partners through the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And you can see that foods that tended to worsen symptoms were just so much more than foods that would improve. And I think this goes to fact about why our patients are also malnourished and why they tend to follow these diet elimination uh, programs because they cannot tolerate so many foods, especially when they have really active disease. And some of the foods we want them to avoid, like really fatty foods or fried foods, right? Because we know those are not good, food, not good foods for them. But there's some food in here, like high fiber foods, that we know that are linked to actually good things and, and that patients that have high fiber diets over a long period of time actually tend to be more in remission than those that don't. So we really have to think about ways that we can introduce soluble fibers into the diet instead of having them avoid fiber altogether. And lastly, this study that was done a couple of years ago through also IBD partners looked at consumption of red meat and, and processed meat. And long story short, what they found, and they ra it was a randomized control study, and they randomized one arm to high intake, another arm to low intake of red meat. And what they found is, and they wanted to look at, by the way, I should tell you, the primary outcome was whether disease relapse occurred over a period of follow-up. And basically, you can see the survival curve, which is very much, you can see the colors, they, they very much go line in line with each other. And basically, there was no difference between the high red meat intake group and the low red meat intake group, really highlighting that 
Perhaps it's not just about avoiding red meat or one food product in particular. It really speaks about developing diet patterns such as a Mediterranean diet, right? And thinking about fiber and thinking about avoiding processed foods that is really telling us the whole picture. However, one caveat to this study is that we really don't know what the patients in the low red meat group ended up eating in replacement. So could they have ended up eating more processed foods in return? We don't really know that. But that's an interesting th study to discuss. And so the last, I'll leave you with some thoughts. As a diet researcher, I think it's important for us to think about how we can incorporate diet into the treatment regimen of patients with Crohn's disease. I've highlighted some studies like the Crohn's disease exclusion diet that really looked at diet as treatment as monotherapy. So could we start to think about those patients with more mild to moderate Crohn's disease and in lieu of starting them on intermittent courses of Entocort, could we start to do things like diet interventions to prevent so many corticosteroids? And can we identify diet responsive patients from the beginning, perhaps while you're waiting for that payer to accept your biologic? Could you put them on a diet that will allow you to identify that they're diet responsive in the first place? And so that perhaps later on you could use diet as your armamentarium, not thinking about just drugs, but maybe even as improvement of, of drug loss of response, could you add diet to that? Or could you think about de-escalating therapy later on, drug de-escalation, when you do intervals of dietary therapy? I'll talk to you a little bit more about drug in the, in the setting of induction therapy, but I think it stands to reason that if you're starting a patient on infliximab, and someone is eating fast food, they may not do as well compared to a patient who's on infliximab but following a Mediterranean diet. And so in lieu of that, we have one systemic meta-analysis, systemic systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at, unfortunately, not diet yet, but entronutrition when adding to infliximab induction. And what they found in these three studies and in the composite odds ratio was that, in fact, adding enteronutrition to your infliximab induction led to a favorable outcome. So I'll leave you at that with the story of diet and IBD, and I think there's more to come. But for our patient, there's many good options out there. Well, Oriana, that was an outstanding presentation. I'm willing to bet that uh, my, like me, many in the audience had never heard such a thoughtful and detailed description of what we are learning about diet in Crohn's disease. Um, there are many questions that have come in already. You hit the jackpot. So to use a Vegas pun, um, I do want to ask you a few though, okay? So first of all, let's clarify. The Crohn's disease exclusion diet versus exclusive enteral nutrition. That was in pediatric patients, right? Well, we've seen two randomized control studies come out in pediatrics. But just recently, an ECHO, and I showed the poster a little bit earlier, it was presented that it can also be effective for adults with mild to moderate Crohn's disease. So far, it's only been one study of okay. about 40 patients. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. Now, the next question that came in is, well, what is the Crohn's disease exclusion diet? Right, that's a great question. So it's about initially, so all these things are done in periods of introduction and phasing out. So it's normally six weeks of about 50% enteronutrition. And it's actually through Modulin, which is now available in the United States. Um, and it also incorporates uh, whole foods, like no preservatives, no additives. And there's a slow introduction over weeks six to 12 of more animal protein, like including food, including fish. And then you start to phase out the entero nutrition, 25% um, from period six to 12 weeks. So you start with essentially an elemental diet. Is that what modulin is? So, so that's a good question. So entero nutrition, right? And there are studies showing that it can be either polymeric, semi-elemental or elemental. But what the studies really show is that either of those three can be effective in inducing remission okay. in patients. All right, so here's the next question. Um, how do you know it's working? Well, that's a great question. So at I've got least, lots of great questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think this is where it's an opportunity for us to identify diet responsive patients, right? And you have to think about perhaps not with the entero nutrition, but with the specific carbohydrate in the Mediterranean, what's really the harm of placing your patient on these diets if they're okay with it, right? But 
Normally, I would recommend following a period of six weeks or six to 12 weeks as was done in the study trials, especially in those patients that you have on mono or on no therapy, really, those patients with mild disease that maybe just intermittently have some flare up of symptoms. And so you can track these things just as you do with drug. You check fecal calprotectin, you check biochemical markers in the blood, and you see if they're dietary responsive. And there's data behind that for the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Yeah, and Miguel is going to cover treat to target and talk to us a little bit more about a general approach to any therapy, including the possibility of diet. Um, there was a very thoughtful question that came in from one of our virtual uh, uh, audience members tonight about social determinants of health and being able to eat. Um, healthier food or learn about these diets. And I know you have a particular interest in that topic, so can you comment a little bit about how that affects our management of Crohn's disease? Gosh, I mean, that is a phenomenal question. Actually, we did, um, I, I did a cross-sectional study and we were presenting that as a, as a poster here, looking at social barriers in IBD and how common food insecurity is, especially um, with the setting of COVID. Um, I think we're seeing that nationally and inevitably with our patients as well. Um, I do think that there are some components of the diet, for example, a Mediterranean diet that can perhaps be a little bit easier for patients with some food insecurity. But I understand the issue. It's a very relevant issue. And what it can tell patients is perhaps what we know the most about diet and IBD is that very processed foods are really what lead to the worst outcomes, like added sugars. So, if you have food insecurity, perhaps trying to eat as much vegetables, fiber, and more leaner meats is the best option. Whether you eat fish may not be as important as whether you eat less ice cream. And so that's one of the most important things to mention to our patients. Very, very important. Obviously, more work needs to be done. So let me go back to Millie for a minute because we have learned that L has moderate to severe Crohn's disease with a low albumin and anemia. Would diet play a role here? And what would you tell her when she asks you about that? So I, I will work with my patients. And if they want to use complementary or dietary approaches, we set a goal um, and we set an ability to reassess. But in this instance, I really would be talking to her about her severe risk factors. In fact, I could use the CD path tool and guaranteed she would fall into that very high risk group. And so I would encourage her to use diet, which will definitively help from a symptom standpoint. I have no question about that, combined with biological medical therapy and that the two together can actually be quite synergistic. So meet her halfway um, and use diet as a tool, but also emphasize the need for that early intensive uh, therapy, which frankly should include a, a biologic. Yeah, I completely agree. And I just wanna say to the audience that uh, you should always ask about a patient's diet. Don't wait for them to ask you about it because you want to know, and this shows that you're interested in it, and then you can educate them about the difference between diet and nutrition, right? What they eat versus what their body needs and address concerns they may have or theories they may have themselves about why they've developed this or food exclusions that they've already instituted because they read online that going gluten-free was gonna be helpful or something else that's actually not supported by data. And you want to address this rather than wait for the patient to ask or not ask and then go home and be told something different by someone who means well but has their own opinions about all this. All right, well, let's look at our guideline-based uh, recommendations for therapy and get into some of our treatments. So if you look at the American College of Gastroenterology guidelines for Crohn's disease that were updated in 2018, for moderate to severe Crohn's disease, as have been, has been defined by Millie so well tonight, you have a number of options. The first is oral steroids, but only for short-term induction. Um, but of course, it does play a role in some patients who need it. Remember though that oral steroids are not really a treatment for perianal disease, but they work well for luminal inflammatory disease. You of course have our anti-TNF agents, and we have three different drugs within that class. Uh, and that is uh, appropriate for steroid resistant uh, or thiopurine or methotrexate refractory disease, the so-called conventional therapies. And so we often have to use those before we can get to the anti-TNFs. And we've learned from a comparative effectiveness study that when you use infliximab, you can have a greater likelihood of a steroid-free remission if you use it in combination with azathioprine. Now that's been extrapolated to the possibility of using it in combination with oral methotrexate. Uh, 
And so we've learned this, but it's specifically in patients who are naive to treatment. That's what the data show. In general, we still accept that likely if you're using infliximab and probably adalimumab, you should do so as a combination approach. And there's some movement there to try and better define that. Then, of course, we have an anti-integrin therapy, vetolizumab. There's actually another anti-integrin that people are not using very often, but still available, natalizumab. These drugs work by blocking leukocyte trafficking out of blood vessels into the inflamed tissue. And this can be done with or without an immunomodulator, although more recent data suggest that the immunomodulator doesn't add much and may distract from your safety of vetolizumab. And lastly, ustekinumab is available and a good option for patients who failed steroids, thiopurines, methotrexate, anti-TNFs, or those who are anti-TNF naive. Now, how do you make some decisions? Well, you can look at some of the data and you can also look at systematic reviews and try to figure out what are the relative benefits from an efficacy point of view of these different options for induction in moderate to severe Crohn's. So what you're seeing here is a summary of the different studies of drug versus placebo and looking at the relative benefit of the drug over placebo. Now the challenge here, of course, is that these studies, while they're similar in design, they're not identical. And for example, the infliximab studies, especially the early ones, there were no previous exposures to biologics because this was the only drug that was being studied. So those were all biologic naive patients. And in some of these other studies, patients could have already been on other drugs. But if you just look at the location of the diamonds on the right-hand side, you can see which therapies seem to be most effective, at least in this analysis. And you can gently see that infliximab and adalimumab sort of edge out some of the others. But this is no way to compare therapies. It just shows you what we should already know. Drugs that are approved and available are better than placebo. So what else can we look at? Well, we now have the first head-to-head -head biological study looking at benefit of one drug versus another in Crohn's disease, and I'll tell you more about that on the next slide. We also have a number of subgroup analyses in randomized controlled trials, large real-world evidence studies looking at administrative claims data, trying to figure out which drug works better when it's used first, and which drug might be better when you need a second or third therapy. And what we've learned from some of these, mostly subgroup analyses and some real-world evidence, is that, uh, for example, um, most drugs, if they've come as a second-line agent after a first anti-TNF, will work less well than if they're used first. So another way to say that is that the first drug you use is likely to work the best, right? Now that may be because the disease is shorter duration. It may also be an artifact of the clinical trials where people who get into clinical trials who failed other therapies may have more refractory disease to begin with. But nonetheless, choosing your first therapy is really important because you're gonna get your biggest bang for the buck with that first therapy. So we've learned, for example, that ustekinumab is still effective after patients have failed one or more anti-TNF therapies. That's good to know. So you have a drug that you should be considering before you might otherwise send them to surgery or run out of options. We also know ustekinumab works very well after patients have been on vetolizumab and if it doesn't work in Crohn's. And we've also learned that if you start with vetolizumab, you can still go to TNF inhibitors and have the same result as if you started with a TNF inhibitor. In other words, you're not losing anything if you decided to start with veto and then you went to the anti-TNF. But what we've learned is that if you start with an anti-TNF and then go to veto, it's not as effective uh, and it won't last as long. So there are some subtleties to this and there are other reasons to think about how we might choose our therapies. Now the head-to-head -head trial that was presented more recently and hasn't been fully published yet was called C-View. And this was in patients with moderate to severe Crohn's who were biologic naive, and they were randomized to adalimumab or ustekinumab, and the primary endpoint was clinical remission at one year. And what you can see very clearly here is that there wasn't a statistically significant difference between adalimumab and ustekinumab in these biologic naive patients. Now what I always point out to everybody is look at the remission rates of That's these great. patients, 61% and 65% at one year. That's what you get when you treat biologic naive patients early with effective therapy. 
That's a really great result. That's very different than what we see in our pivotal trials where patients have failed other therapies and have longer disease duration. So when you treat people early with good drugs, you can get great results. So that's very important. But you can also see on the right there that the major secondary endpoint of steroid-free clinical remission was not statistically different. There was a slight numerical benefit of USTA over ADA, but not that much. Now you might want to know a little bit more. Well, adalimumab, recall, is dosed in maintenance phase every other week, and that's how it was used in this study. There was not dose escalation. And ustekinumab in maintenance phase is dosed every eight weeks usually. In some parts of the world, it's every eight or 12. But in this study, it was every eight. So there's a difference in terms of convenience of the drugs that may be beneficial to all of you. And when you think about safety, there wasn't that much difference between the two, although the hypothesis was that ustekinumab might be safer than an anti-TNF. Miguel will talk a little bit more about safety when we get to him. Now we also have a real-world effectiveness study of vetalizumab compared with anti-TNF in patients who are naive to therapy, who have Crohn's disease. And what you can see in this particular study was that anti-TNF was superior to vetalizumab for response and remission when patients were naive. So in general, we've accepted that our strongest therapy uh, in patients who are naive when you're comparing anti-TNF to veto is anti-TNF. But at least with adalimumab, it looks like ustekinumab is at least as good as that anti-TNF. Now the other place where this comes up often is what if you start with an anti-TNF and either the patient doesn't respond or they lose response. Remember that half the patients who get anti-TNF for Crohn's will lose response or need dose escalation or a new therapy by the end of one year. That's really an important fact to tell your patients. I want to make sure you respond and I want to make sure you continue to respond because there's a good likelihood that we're going to need to do something else by the end of this year. That can be a really sobering and depressing fact to share with the patient. Well, what we've learned now from two different studies from different places around the world is that after failure of anti-TNF, whether you choose ustekinumab or vetalizumab as your second line therapy matters. And in both of these analyses, ustekinumab was superior to veto as your second line choice in Crohn's disease. So the study on the left was a prospective observational study. That means that they were collecting these data and then they went back and figured out what worked better. And they had adjusted to make sure the patient types were similar. And the patient on the right is a retrospective study from France. So you can appreciate that if you have a choice for a second line therapy after TNF in Crohn's disease, it should be used to kinemab. And I think that makes very good sense to all of us. So having said all that, we're gonna go back to our case and I'm gonna hand it over to Miguel. I think it's, you're up, Miguel. Great, well thank you, David. And so just to build on what uh, David, Millie, uh, and Dr. Damas had said, we come back to L. So L is placed on adalibumab. She's placed on monotherapy 160, uh, induction 80 two weeks later, and then 40 milligrams every other week. And she returns at three months and she's feeling well. Uh, her abdominal exam is benign, she's non-tender. Millie had presented that her hemoglobin started at 10, so it's up to 11. It looks like her CRP is coming down and her albumin is coming, down, uh, coming up nicely. So at this point, we get to the next audience response question, and what would you recommend for L? Would you increase her dose of adalibumab, decrease her interval of adalibumab, add an immunomodulator, check a serum concentration of adalibumab at trough, measure her fecal calprotectin, swap therapy to a different mechanism, or have we completely confused you and you're not sure? So what would you do at this point? I wish the boards had an I'm not sure. Because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. then I would get them all right. <laughs> Pick that a lot. All right, here we go. So number five, measure calprotectin, and then some of you said measure serum concentration. I actually think those would probably be, I was gonna say that probably there are a couple right answers, and I think those are both very reasonable. And that really gets into the monitoring aspect of this. I wanna just uh, for a minute though, take a step back to the ACCENT-1 study and look at the maintenance with infliximab for Crohn's disease. And it's interesting that you can see in this study Week 30 is on the left-hand side, week 54 is on the right-hand side. 
Some of this is actually interesting in that it's not as much about the bars and the efficacy, but it's also the gap in terms of where we still could go. So we still have a percentage of patients who are not completely optimized. Then there's the PANT study. So if we take a personalized anti-TNF therapy in Crohn's disease, and on the right-hand side, you'll see infliximab, and then on the far right-hand side, adalimumab, and just to ground you in what the, the metrics look like. So the red are no concomitant immunomodulator, and then the blue is immunomodulator. So you can actually see that there is a high percentage of the patients who develop anti-drug antibodies. So nearly 63% of these patients in infliximab uh, and 28.5% uh, in adalimumab. So we can do a lot better. And this is when we start to get into this concept of precision medicine or targeted therapy. You've heard this in some of the conferences Prior to today, also at ACG, this came up a couple of times today in the postgraduates course and others. When we look at HLA DQA105 and immunogenicity, this is, I think, our first glimpse into what I would consider a precise approach to immunogenicity, more specifically with infliximab, but to some degree with adalimumab. So what does this mean? So if you look at the top left for a minute, and on the y-axis is this is percentage without anti-drug antibodies, so no antibodies to drug. And then you look at the HLA-DQ variant, and then the yellow are zero copies, the kind of darker purple is one copy, and then kind of the light or pink purple are two copies. And what you can see is without having this HLA-DQ variant, there's a less likelihood of forming antibodies to infliximab. So on the right-hand side, if you look at the bars, you even see a further separation. So what this means is that we could probably do better than those percentages that we're seeing in terms of treatment by measuring HLA-DQ. And this may be a question that some of you ask and we'll get to on the panel whether or not or who is measuring this. So what are some of the pillars or what we would consider the pillars of IBD care? And this is really now getting into monitoring of disease and this concept of actually monitoring disease, not just monitoring drug, but monitoring disease. So on the top is the change in the course of IBD. And then one pillar is early intervention, treat to target, and tight control. And obviously at the base is communication with your patient and making sure that they understand and have an understanding of what our target looks like. So the treat to target in IBD has evolved over time. We obviously do a baseline assessment. We make a decision on our initial treatment. Millie already outlined some of the prognostic factors in terms of severity of disease. But then we get into this, this cycle of measurements and monitoring. And I think this is really true to the way I practice as well. So we start a treatment, uh, then over the next six to 12 weeks, we do an assessment. And then after the assessment, we say, has the target been met, yes or no? If the target has been met, they go more or less into this monitoring or chronic phase. And then at some point, we get into whether or not we can actually de-escalate therapy. However, within the first three months, if we have not achieved or met our target, we need to talk to our patient about what's the next step? How hard do we push? What do we switch to? How do we adjust therapy until we reach that target? And then ultimately, when we reach the target, we get into a more of a disease monitoring phase. What does monitoring mean today in terms of disease activity? And you heard this from Elle's case to some degree. Well, there's blood markers, specifically CRP, but don't forget hemoglobin is a marker as well, and there are others like an albumin uh, that can come into play. There's also this concept of endoscopic healing. There's an endoscopic healing index where you combine certain biomarkers with endoscopic markers. Stool markers, I think most of us have become very familiar with calprotectin, and certainly during the pandemic, this is something that we've sent off more regularly, and I think we're getting more comfortable with it. Lactoferrin for certain parts of the country and hospitals may still be a marker. I think we find that less sensitive and specific than the calprotectin, which is probably the preferred marker in IBD. Obviously, endoscopy, radiographic imaging. The very last bullet point's interesting, and small bowel ultrasound has been an emerging 
tool, certainly in different parts of the world and now in the United States, as potentially a tool that we as gastroenterologists can use in our practices as well. So when we think about targets that are individualized, and if you just look at the number, the initial treatment number one, then we assess the target, and then you can see, again, on the right-hand side are different measurements of disease activity. And we're constantly going through this adjustment in treatment, assessment of target. How has this changed over the years? Well, it's not just symptom-based anymore. It's objective criteria to define a change in target and a change in treatment, potentially. In kids, on the left-hand side is growth and development. That's certainly, for pediatrics, a very important target that must be met. Sometimes the growth curves are, I think, some the, the best surrogate marker uh, for inflammation in children. So just the last couple slides, looking at subclinical disease activity also defines reactive therapeutic drug monitoring. So what does that mean? So consider for a minute on the left-hand side is proactive monitoring and looking at fecal calprotectin less than 250. So this concept of proactive monitoring for inflammatory markers, proactive monitoring for drugs. So really the most proactive approach. On the right-hand side are probably what most of you and us are doing, which is more of a reactive monitoring, where you may actually measure fecal calprotectin, especially if a patient's having symptoms. If the fecal calprotectin is elevated over 250, but for example, in this case, an infliximab level is obtained, and it's less than 150, then we get into, well, how do we monitor this patient over time? How do we adjust in terms of the drug? If it's a patient who has a persistently high fecal calprotectin over 250, then we really get into the nitty gritty of what the drug level looks like. So for example, if they have a high fecal calprotectin but a good drug level over 10, then we probably want to switch not to another anti-TNF but out of class. However, if they're showing active inflammation with a high fecal calprotectin but have a low level of drug, less than 10, then this is something where we can optimize therapy by either increasing the dose of infliximab or shortening the interval. And then finally, if they have no drug or loss of drug completely, very low level, then we want to really know are they forming antibodies. David already mentioned this, but I think it's important to note that ustekinumab and vedolizumab both have very low immunogenicity. So when we talk about drug levels and measuring levels, I think this is most specific to infliximab, to some degree, adalibumab. And then finally getting into the COM trial, which is this kind of tighter control, looking at tight control uh, of therapy versus clinical management. And essentially what this, the COM study uh, looked at were patients that were followed very proactively and changes in treatment were obtained based on certain parameters versus a clinical management group, which is essentially a, a group of patients where they followed the symptoms but didn't look at the objective markers as closely. And what you can see on the bars on the right-hand side is the tight control group, the group that had this more proactive monitoring of therapy, had 45.9% had primary endpoint met with mucosal healing. And then at the bottom, you can say steroid-free remission over time, which was also significantly higher in the tight control group, which meant fewer hospitalizations, longer period of remission, although there was a higher cost associated with monitoring with those less uh, utilization parameters like fewer hospitalizations, you could make the argument overall that the cost was less. And then certainly the quality of life also improved. Um, and then COM as far as following up an impact of induction of deep remission, again, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve looking at Crohn's disease patients who achieve endoscopic or deep remission after one year of tight control, they were less likely to have disease progression over the next uh, median of three years. So what this essentially tells us is if we get it right early in induction, we monitor the patient, they're more likely to stay in remission over time. And then Stardust was a treat-to-target versus standard of care with ustekinumab in Crohn's disease, where the primary endpoint was week 48 endoscopic response. And then 441 patients out of 500 patients were then re-randomized at week eight, 
to a treat to target, and then or a standard of care group. So essentially, again, getting into that tight control group versus standard of care. And then at week 48, you can see that the majority of patients completed this study, but it was interesting. We actually saw a similar improvement in the SESCD, mucosal healing, steroid-free remission and response, and biomarker between the two groups, and there was no difference in overall uh, safety signals. So uh, again, I think it's interesting that we see variances within our studies, but we still get into this concept of tight control. And then finally, before we end with the case uh, conclusion, there's a lot of discussion now about safety. And I think as we're having more and more medicines come out where we're seeing similar efficacy rates, safety is gonna become paramount in terms of understanding the positioning of treatment and potentially which treatment we would choose. So this is a safety period that we put together a couple years ago, uh, where steroids are obviously at the bottom of the safety pyramid, and you can see at the top of the safety pyramid, now in parity, really used to kinemab and vedolizumab. But don't forget as well that inadequate treatment is an adverse event into itself. So we'll go back to the case of L, whose adalibumab level is 14, so good level, over 10, no anti-drug antibodies. Um, there was a dose adjustment to weekly, and maybe we can discuss that uh, as well. But uh, after two months, eight doses, her CRP is now 12, and she's symptomatic. So she's actually getting an optimal drug. She has a good drug level. Now she's on weekly. Now she switched to ustekinumab, and the reason for switching to ustekinumab really is because she had adequate level of drug, no antibody, and she started to have active inflammation. So she's given the IV loading dose and injection and scheduled for a colonoscopy at four months. So within three to six months, she undergoes a colonoscopy, which you can see here. Uh, this is actually looking at pretty normal uh, ileum, so we're not seeing any active inflammation or active disease. Um, so we've kind of more or less Beautiful. achieved our endoscopic target. So David, I think I'm gonna turn it back to you to wrap us up with our SMART goals and then maybe yeah. we'll get into some more questions. Okay, well I wanna just summarize the case for a moment. So you'll recall that when the patient was put on adalimumab and had follow-up, she was feeling well. Some of her labs were improved, but her CRP was still elevated. So what Miguel has just taught us about is, number one, the predictive value of an elevated inflammatory marker when somebody is feeling well. It's a sign that they may lose response and that there's still active inflammation driving this. And so treat to target, and the CALM study would advise that you go to weekly dosing if you wanna to try to gain more control. And despite doing that, as you now heard, she was still having problems and then ended up switching. And you've learned that the choice for your second line agent would be used to kinemab. Uh, and I wonder how she would have done if used to had been her first line drug. Okay, so let me review our SMART goals and then there's some great questions from our virtual audience as well as the folks who are in the room here. So the SMART goals are the specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely uh, goals. So personalized, targeted therapy best sets patients up for success throughout their journey. You should integrate risk stratification and disease prognosis into your treatment decision making. Factor, obviously, efficacy, safety, tolerability, and convenience when you make treatment decisions. And remember that when patients are sick and you're talking about induction, there's gonna be more likely uh, focus on efficacy than when they reach a stable maintenance phase and you're talking about long-term therapy when they're gonna think a little bit more about safety. And I'm gonna ask the, uh, the panel about some of this in a moment. And then lastly, optimize your treatment by implementing an established monitoring plan. And we really do think it's time now for all of our patients with Crohn's disease for sure to be enrolled in treat to target strategies. So with that, I wanna thank my panel, but we have a whole list of questions here that I'm gonna take you guys through. And we're gonna start with Miguel. Um, I wanna go back to the safety you mentioned briefly. Um, one of the audience members wanted to know what's the long-term safety of ustekinumab. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so the, well, we actually now have a, a number of safety endpoints. So the long-term extension data are out. 
We have long-term safety, not just in IBD Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but we also have this with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And the bottom line is that we have not seen any new safety signals, which means the same good safety profile that we saw our induction and our maintenance one-year studies have extrapolated forward, which specifically means no new signals around infection or opportunistic infection, uh, lymphoma or cancer, which I think would be considered some of the big safety considerations in biologic therapy. Yeah, I mean, in fact, people who got placebo had more infections and complications yeah. than those who received ustekinumab. Um, another question related to safety is what about vetalizumab? Do we have long-term safety of that agent? Similarly, uh, similar and, and similar good safety in terms of those parameters. We have seen some patients, not necessarily new, but that did have some transient elevation in their liver function tests. Uh, we've talked a lot about arthralgias, but nothing specifically has panned out in terms of any detrimental effect in terms of joints or other aspects of safety. So the safety with vetalizumab also looks quite good. And I think if you were to look at the pyramid, probably those two at the top would still hold true. Right. Um, Millie, why measure fecal calprotectin in this case? Does that have a role here? Was that the right choice? So I, I, think, I think so. It's a non-invasive marker. You know, when we look at the data in Calm that Miguel presented, um, they measured both CRP and fecal cal. But in that tight control paradigm, it was more often an elevated fecal cal that drove change in treatment. So I do think it is a marker that has utility and, and, and something we can really drive to as a target. I will say it probably has somewhat less sensitivity and specificity in the small bowel as compared to the colon. And so, as David taught me, it's really nice to anchor it to a colonoscopy when you can. So at the initial presentation, when she was you know, quite inflamed, we knew what her colonoscopy showed, that would be a good time to get a fecal cal and see what that number is. So you have kind of a starting range. And then as you apply treat to target, as Miguel mentioned, you could then assess a, a follow-up fecal cal to look for the response. Yeah, I, I have taught my nursing team to do what we call biomarker benchmarking. So when I finish a colonoscopy, I'll put in the endoscopy report what test I want to order to correlate it to that finding so I'll know what to look at in follow-up. The only pearl I'll add to this is that we don't do the CalPro right away after the colonoscopy, oh, yeah. <laughs> where we've done biopsies and traumatized the inside of the bowel a little bit, um, but rather several weeks later, and then you can try to correlate those things. So I do think that was a reasonable choice in this patient, and that was a nice question from our audience there. Um, all right, Oriana, there's a few questions here that I think you'll be uh, really helpful for us. Some uh, individuals wanted to know a little bit more about, um, is there an ethnic variation in the incidence of Crohn's? Do we see it different in different populations? Or as uh, IBD has spread across the globe, does it look the same everywhere? These are all great questions. Um, so actually, I do look at, it par as part of my research, I have looked at ethnicity as a variable in, in the prevalence of IBD. And I can tell you we don't have it perfect just yet. But we are seeing an increasing trend, in, including in Latin America, of more IBD, particularly ulcerative colitis. However, we do know that in places like Brazil and Puerto Rico, where IBD has been present for a longer period of time, we're starting to see a little bit more Crohn's disease. So it's almost that population study where we look at, and, and this has been repeated over and over in time, where we look at uh, the prevalence of IBD hitting a population or an emerging population, we start to see UC surface first, and then over time we start to see Crohn's disease. So we definitely do see that in, in terms of Hispanic populations, Latin Americans, we also see an increasing rise among Asians, Southeast Asians as well. So it is an emerging disease of which an intricately diet is one of the most important culprits. And as we become more westernized, it's important for us to recognize that the environment is playing an important role. So environment more than genetics. I do think so. I mean, I, I think the, most of the patients that we look at in terms of these emerging populations don't have a family history of IBD. All right, another, that's great, thank you. Another question for you. What about a low FODMAP diet? Is that helpful for treating Crohn's disease? You know, I was hoping people would ask that. Um, I do think it's a great question because 
the low FODMAP does help in IBS, and we know that it can really help those symptoms of bloating. Um, there was a recent study that was published in Gastro about a year ago that looked at a low FODMAP diet in the setting of quiescent IBD. And what they found is that patients that were in this low FODMAP diet did have improvement of their bloating and their typical more IBS type symptoms. However, when they looked at biochemical markers of inflammation over time, they found that it really didn't prevent any relapses. And so it's important for our patients and for us to recognize that as we build into the armamentarium IBD treatments and diet into the treatment paradigm, we give diets that will help with inflammation as well. So if your patient is in, in remission, you can consider adding low FODMAPs into the treatment strategy, but keep in mind that these will not help with biochemical uh, reduction of inflammation. Yeah, I'll just add that being on a low FODMAP diet is not fun. Uh, so you should consider trying it yourself and then you'll know what you're trying to tell your patients to go do. Um, this, was, this diet was developed by a, a really uh, thoughtful uh, nutrition and dietitian individual in uh, Melbourne, Australia. And you can go to their website uh, through the Monash University and uh, they have a wonderful resource there that I send patients to when they want to learn about it. So that's my last question for you, Oriana, which is where else can people learn about some of these diets? Are there good resources available yes. if they want to use that for themselves or for patients? Actually, there are a couple of them. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation does have a link to diet and, and the setting of IBD and some useful information. There's also a really nice um, tool that I've learned uh, that actually I, I was in communication with the person that developed it and it's called Nutrition Therapy for Crohn's Disease. And it's a really nice website that really highlights all the different mm -hmm. diets that are available, including diets that we didn't discuss today for the purposes of time, like the anti-inflammatory diet, the autoimmune diet, and then the modified specific carbohydrate diet. So I would encourage the audience and clinicians to look at this website and for patients as well, because it really is helpful. So my general points about this is that I think that we're finally moving the needle a little bit in diet and IBD, but you have to be careful that you understand the difference between diet and nutrition, that you measure those micronutrients that Oriana reminded us about, and that you use a treat to target strategy just like you would if you were starting adalimumab or ustekinumab. You measure that the diet or whatever intervention you're using is doing what you hope and need it to do. All right, Millie, should we have used azathioprine with the adalimumab in L? I would have, yes, um, for a couple of reasons. You know, I, I, while we're extrapolating, uh, the SONIC trial showed us fairly clearly that infliximab plus azathioprine was superior to biologic monotherapy. And I do worry she was hypoalbuminemic when we started, and there's just not a lot of room for error there in terms of her um, wasting a uh, drug in her stool and really dropping to low levels. So I think at least in the first six months, um, it would be important in someone like Elle to use combination therapy almost as a cover, so you can make sure to get to an appropriate drug level. And I just want to remind the audience, both virtually and here, that when we think about some of the safety signals and concerns associated with that purines, which Miguel showed us there, kind of towards the bottom of the pyramid that he showed, but remember that that's not necessarily with relatively short-term use of a year or so. So I often tell my patients, look, we want to put our best foot forward. We want to get you well. And we're really going to reassess this very carefully over the next 6 to 12 months. And then at that point, reassess whether they truly still need that thiopurine. And so I think it's really, really reassuring for patients to hear that you know, those risks of lymphoma you don't see in the first year. And so I, I think really have some of those conversations and think about prioritizing efficacy because Miguel's pyramid also showed us that ineffective or, or partial treatment also can result in complications. Yeah, I think that that's a, an excellent point. Um, and uh, what I used to say is that when the drug level drops too low and then they get the next dose, even if they're staying on their schedule, that's like episodic therapy. I call it pseudo-episodic therapy, right? Because effectively, there's no drug present in between doses. So when you give the next dose, you're essentially exposing the patient to a strong antigen that can stimulate immunogenicity. So that's the whole concept. You want to protect them early. Now, in the case of L, that didn't really happen. That wasn't the issue. Yep. It's just that she didn't have a complete remission, and it wasn't a sustained remission. So the other point I'm going to address in one of the questions is what does durable mean? Durable means that the drug lasts as long as we need it to, which is until something... <clears throat> um, that's different than sustained. 
Sustained means that it works continuously and has its job. Durable means that overall it's working. What is, what is the difference? Well, it ends up being clinical trial semantics, but it essentially means that in a clinical trial, if at every time point you assess an individual patient, they're doing great, as opposed to we look at them at the beginning, we look at them at, at one time point, and we look at them at the end, and they're all fine, but all the in-betweens we didn't measure, and the patient was up and down all that time. That's not sustained. Sustained means as soon as they respond and are in remission, they're doing great all the time and as long as we want them, which is durable. So those concepts are important because remember that 99.99% of the time that patients live, they're not with us. It's 0.01% that they're talking to their doctor or their nurses and are in our office. So we want sustained and durable treatment. All right, so having said all that, I'm gonna to go to the next question. Miguel, when you, uh, Decrease the interval for use to kinemab. When do you reassess to know if you've achieved your target? Yeah, so the, the, in my practice, I think we, we probably need more data on this, but in my practice, I do th essentially three doses. So give ev I usually go every six weeks, three doses, and then I'll assess after the third dose. And how we assess is generally CRP, calprotectin, if it's UC, you could do a sigmoidoscopy, you can reach the disease. Uh, if it's Crohn's disease, whether it's cross-sectional imaging. However, one, one thing I do want to pause on, I think this is a concept we're talking about, is some of the changes we see may take longer. So I think if the patient's symptomatically improving, the CRP and Calprotect are improving after those three dose-adjusted intervals, I'm okay with that, and, and if they're not perfect in terms of cross-sectional imaging or endoscopy, that's okay, even to the point now that I've delayed doing cross-sectional imaging and endoscopy, because I think there is a bit of a lag. So that's, that's what I've done in my practice. Um, the access to increasing doses or intervals of ustekinumab is probably a, a, a larger barrier because that's off-label, and we run into some issues with the payers, but uh, to answer your question, three doses. Miguel, do you, I'm just curious, um, in your practice, do you check a level or do no. you just dose adjust? So uh, I have not. Uh, so, I, don't, I don't either, so I'm with yeah, you on no, that. Yeah, no, no, so don't. I have not. I think we're learning the level, so you've seen the data and we use 4.5 and like it above 4.5, but because the immunogenicity is so low and I, I think we all practice the same way, the level itself is not much as much for antibody and if the level is four to six, for example, I don't know, I mean, is that good or bad? So for the most part, I'm trying to decrease the interval. The challenge, again, doesn't become our desire to do that and our want to try three doses, but with the payer. Now, I will tell the payer to the point, David, of your question or whoever asked the question, um, if, I, if we do get the fortunate opportunity to have the appeal where you have somebody on the other line, um, that I, I tell them, look, let's, let's, we've been through, this is the therapies they've been on, the patient's doing well, let's give this a basically a three to six month right. time period. And if at the end of that time period, it is probably something that I would stop anyway. So from a payer standpoint, completely understand what that means, but also the compromise of let's give it a defined amount of time. But I agree with you, if I can get them on the phone, they'll sometimes approve the short term without the long term. The key it's, phrase it's, there is I if I can get them. It depends who you get them. So uh, let me just give um, a little bit of our experience. From the University of Chicago, we published our experience with dose escalation of ustekinumab in 506 patients in CGH a couple years ago now. And what we found was that decreasing the interval did work in a number of patients, but it was the people who had a clear response when they got their loading and their first maintenance dose or their first injection. So of the patients who did well with those initial doses and then were not achieving their target or were losing response later, they were the ones who seemed to do well when you uh, changed your intervals. Um, we didn't find so much success in the people who were primary non-responders right. after a couple of doses, even if you waited out to four months. So that seems to be the key there. Yeah. And I completely agree. I don't check levels with ustekinumab. Um, if, they're, if I think that I can recapture them or try to push them, I will do a shorter interval. I'll do it uh, two or three times and then reassess their targets. Um, one of the audience members wanted to know, are we ordering the HLA haplotype for immunogenicity? 
and I mentioned this in my postgraduate presentation this morning. Um, I don't think that it's going to change my management personally uh, because uh, I still think that the relative prediction with that haplotype isn't strong enough to change whether I'm going to do combo therapy when I start an anti-TNF uh, or mono. Uh, but I'm interested in my colleagues. Have you had any experience with it and what are you doing? So we were actually able to convince UNC to run it for us just off of the, the celiac disease testing assay. So we can actually get this. Um, so we've started to experiment a little bit with it. And I'll say the two scenarios I've used it in, um, I think it's pretty clear I use a lot of combination therapy in my practice. But let's say a, an older individual with multiple comorbidities where I really may not want to use combination therapy. I, I have checked it a few times in those instances. And then the other instance that I've found it to be helpful is when I have someone on combination therapy and they're doing well, and I'm actually thinking about dropping to monotherapy, um, it, it has influenced my decision in terms of whether I want to make that drop of the immunomodulator. So the argument that's been made about this, and that's exactly how I would try to interpret it, is that if you have enough drug present, um, you're going to avoid the issue of immunogenicity anyway, or at least we would hope so. So I think there's more studies that need to be done to clarify where this is going to be. Um, Miguel, somebody asked, what's the endoscopic healing index, and do you use it? Uh, I do not use it, no. Uh, the endoscopic healing in index is a combination, essentially, of serum markers with endoscopy that calculates a score that will predict or should predict um, uh, have a predictive factor in terms of endoscopic healing and long-term success. I, I don't use it. I, I just, I've been using it, but because I want to study it. Yeah. Um, but this is a, it gives you a quantitative score for how much inflammation right. there is. Um, but I think we need to know a little bit more. That was there's a nice paper in Gastro where they validated it using some different data sets. But I think we have to think about whether it's sensitive enough right. and helpful enough for what we want to do. Well, we've covered an awful lot of ground, and I want to thank our panel again. Um, and I'm actually going to uh, bring our program to a close, and I'm very grateful that you've all joined us. So first of all, I want to remind you that if you have colleagues who missed today's live program, this webcast will be available on the Gastroenterology Hub, which also has other resources for both clinicians and patients. Of course, I want to thank Dr. Damas, Dr. DeLong, and Dr. Riguero for joining me, and I want to thank them for a great program. This was outstanding. And Oriana, you uh, did a great <laughs> job as we knew you would at your first symposium. Uh, I want to wish you. everyone safety and hopefully good luck at the casino tables. Um, <laughs> and I want to make sure that you go home and improve the care for all your patients who have IBD. To receive credit for this program, click on the Request Credit tab to complete the post-test, which is very important, and the evaluation, which will enable us to improve future programs. You can also fill in your ABIM ID number and date of birth, and CME Outfitters will kindly submit your credit to ABIM. With that, I wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.